I'm Joe Devine, and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. A quick note to remind listeners that we are continuing to run little competitions on our YouTube channel and various other social networks. Um, The prizes are mainly books, but very good football books. Uh, So do check out the channel to see how you can enter. So far, we've given away Lutz van den Stiel's autobiography and uh, a few editions of Michael Cox's new book, The Mixer, which is all about the tactical history of the Premier League. It's a super interesting read. We've got, uh, I think, four more competitions to run. Uh, the third one is starting uh, this week. This podcast comes out on, on a Monday, so the third competition should be starting uh, today. Um, and there is plenty more prizes to win, so do check it out. Today I'm joined by Paul Ansorge uh, to talk about the 1978 World Cup in Argentina, um, and the controversy surrounding that tournament, and also within that context, how we might look forward and think about the Qatar tournament in 2022. So uh, thanks for downloading the podcast, and I hope you enjoy it. Paul, David Winner describes the 1978 World Cup as a, as a tournament that, that should never have taken place. Um, he was referring to, as you also refer to in the video, the fact that Argentina was at the time under the control uh, of a military who had taken force during a coup two years prior. Um, And as part of the junta, it's estimated that up to 30,000 people were disappeared, mostly young people, uh, political activists, uh, human rights activists, uh, just other people generally who disobeyed the military. And by disappeared, I think we can all... I think there's a consensus that 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 means that they were murdered. Um, how much of this was was known to the other countries at the time, or at least the public of other competing countries? Because I imagine that the, you know at the time might have been a difference between what the government of countries would know and what the public would know. But d- did the public know much about it? Was it a, a topic of conversation at the time or, or before the tournament? Well, what what Winner says is that um, essentially the information that came out of Argentina was provided by human rights groups, particularly Amnesty International. Um, There uh, there was a group called the Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, um, uh, who were an Argentinian group, and there were campaigns by small leftist groups in Europe leftist groups being winners words rather than mine uh, but no no nation com- boycotted the world cup for a long time um people thought that johan cruyff had boycotted for political reasons but i think we covered in the video that actually it was much more personal but a player that did um boycott for political reasons was uh, west germany's paul breitner this kind of legendary cult figure very left wing very left-leaning, which in West Germany was a pretty controversial position to take at the time. Um, So, so no, there were definitely people that knew, but no one boycotted the World Cup because of that. Um, So, uh, an Argentinian writer called Jorge Luis Borges um, called it a national calamity before it happened. And uh, a chap called Andrew Graham Yule, who was the former news editor of the Buenos Aires Herald, who fled uh, to Britain months after the coup, um, had a letter from a family member in Buenos Aires who scolded him for writing terrible things about Argentina in uh, what they called his awful new left-wing paper. He was writing for The Guardian at the time. Um, so in Argentina, there were definitely people that didn't believe that, that there were people being killed, um, but there most certainly were. It's interesting that then, isn't it? I, I suppose that shows the the difference in levels of people's understanding depending on, on on where they were i wonder you know sometimes in in certain situations it seems that it's easier for people outside of the immediate uh, situation to recognize what's happening than it is for people sometimes in the country i'm thinking like north korea as an example of that of course i'm sure that the citizens of north korea know everything's not great but uh you know there's a lot of talk about the the propaganda from the government in a, in a country like that and about how Actually, from outside of the country, it might be a little bit easier to, to at least guess at what's going on than it, than it is for people who were there at the time. Um, what was it? A, was it at all uh, a, a thing that people would boycott the World Cup? I, I suppose. I mean, in 1978, it might have been the sort of thing that was just never really, uh, never really thought of thought of doing. 
Oh no, it was uh, not uncommon. I mean, in in 1950, Argentina boycotted the Brazil World Cup over a disagreement about what had happened in 1949. Um, the uh, the I think we talked about countries from behind the Iron Curtain not participating in that World Cup, and and we were two years away from the American boycott of the Moscow Olympics in 1980, and six years away from the Soviet block boycott of the Los Angeles Olympics in 1984. What's interesting about those, though, is I suppose that they, they're all uh, boycotts for political political reasons that, that, I suppose, serve the countries who are boycotting. Um, but, I mean, it, 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 this, this example with Argentina would be slightly different, I think, because if, you know, as you mentioned, Brightner already, if, if a country was to boycott the Argentina World Cup in 78, it would be uh, presumably upon the grounds of, uh, of, 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 of human rights violations yeah i mean it's it's an interesting question in fact i I should mention um that jonathan stevenson writing on the bbc in 2010 uh talked about a netherlands-led call for a boycott um of that world cup so there were there were dissenting voices the netherlands of course um eventually did go Uh, it's interesting isn't it because you have to set that in the context of 1978 that that uh human rights violations um, were I guess perhaps a less potent motivator than the Cold War, which was was a cause of a tremendous number of boycotts of a tremendous number of sorts of things, um, mm. and 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 it would be interesting to consider whether because uh, this was a, a right wing government. Uh, it was treated differently to an equivalently vile left-wing government uh, at the time, and and whether there would have been a difference in approach there. But I, I don't think, I don't think we can know that for sure. Mm. I mean, we talk about human rights violations, but I think the the reality is that, as we say, during the regime, obviously this this was not, uh, you know, this all happened during the regime. So it's understandable that not all of the figures and the facts would have been apparent at the time. But mm. thirty thousand people. Um, I think it, well the estimation I think is between eighteen thousand and thirty thousand, depending on uh, who you're reading. Um, what people were killed or, or, or disappeared. Um, what what number qualifies as as genocide? I mean, is that is that is that come under the banner of genocide? The definition of uh, of genocide is is actually a pretty complicated uh, definition, and it tends to. Um, tends to involve killing members of a particular group what this is is a a vast mass killing um and and, you know we say human rights violations and i don't know somehow that just doesn't seem like strong enough language to use you know this is this was true and also i'm sorry to interrupt but i would say um are you absolutely right it was it was a broader array of people who were killed as i said earlier a lot of people were uh, political activists, or, or I, th- I think generally people who who lean to the left, uh, lean to the left, and were you know were, were dissidents. I think they might have been called at the time. Um, mm-hmm. But also, what's interesting, I was reading yesterday that a um, a disproportionate number of Jewish people were also killed, uh, in, and I think they were particularly targeted. Um, yeah, um, I mean, anyone that the regime didn't like, so leftist people, gay people, Jewish people, all all, all manner of of uh people that the government found to be distasteful and and as often happens that that broadened out over the the run of that government now i should say at this point like i would not consider myself an expert on the military regime in argentina in the 70s this is this is a potted guide rather than detail if you if you are interested in more detail there are lots of uh, of books and 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 actually a really good place to start is is david winner's article in the financial times about about how that affected the world cup the um the organizer of the world cup was killed uh, in the in the lead up to it um it it was really messy and and you know winners moral uh, absolutism is is a complicated thing something that you and I have talked about many times Joe but i think winners basic assertion that this world cup should never have taken place is absolutely is kind of basically inarguable because in the end what it turned into was a World Cup which propped up an absolutely vicious regime in the most kind of obvious way possible. Yeah, I think, and, I, and also I think you know from from the sounds of 
of uh, all the claims about rigged matches, etc. It sounds like a, a bit of a farce from a football side as well. I, I would echo your thoughts, though, about uh, listeners who might be interested in, in, in reading more. I read some fascinating stuff yesterday about how there were sort of links to... to to um, Nazism uh, within the regime at the time, and there's lots of uh, anecdotal stories of people who were, were captured and tortured, who were taken to rooms with lots of Nazi memorabilia and, and portraits of Adolf Hitler and, and, and things like that. It's a fascinating and very sad uh, period of history. Let's move on, though, to talk about um, the coach of the Argentina side now, though, uh, because I, I said, as I said before, there are, there are persisting claims about rigged matches during the tournament, um, aiding Argentina's overall victory, who of course won the cup. Um, in our tactics video that covered this era, Alex Stewart cites Tim Vickery in saying that there is a tendency to overlook the tactical successes of the Argentina side. Um, it should also be noted that the coach at the time, Cesar Luis Menotti, was a very interesting character. Uh, the beginning of this quote appears in the tactical video of the era, but I thought it was worth reading out the whole thing to give you an idea as to the type of man in charge of the team. He said, I maintain that a team above all is an idea, and more than an idea, it is a commitment. And more than a commitment, it is the clear convictions that a coach must transmit to his players to defend the idea. So my concern is that we coaches don't arrogate to ourselves the right to remove from the spectacle the synonym of festival in favour of a philosophical reading that cannot be sustained, which is to avoid taking risks. And in football, there are risks because the only way you can avoid taking risks in any game is by not playing. Minotti is also quoted as uh, saying to his team, don't win it for them, referring to the generals. Uh, which I think is, you know, a sort of, a, a, I suppose, slightly positive look back at the Argentinian team. Um, you know, as with much of history, but it's very difficult to comprehend the complexities of situations like the 78 World Cup. But I suppose it's also fair to say that, that it was definitely sad for everyone, uh, including the Argentina squad themselves. Yeah, I, I don't think the players come out of this as the villain of the piece by any stretch of the imagination. So Leopold Luque scored four goals. Um, and and later said, with what I know now, I can't say I'm proud of my victory. But I didn't realise, most of us didn't, we just played football. Um, and Ricky Villa said, um, there's no doubt that we were used politically. But I, I genuinely don't think they knew it at the time. Um, mm. uh, and uh, the, Luque was also then asked about match fixing and said, I don't know, honestly. Uh, but Videla, Videla, the leader of the Hunter, did many bad things, much worse than bribing. Um, and then he said, but we did play a tremendous game against Peru because this is one of the most controversial games. Uh, Peru had an Argentinian-born goalkeeper. A Peruvian senator alleged that um, in return for throwing the match, Videla handled some Peruvian dissidents for the Peruvian government. Um, you know, th- there's no doubt that this is this is sad for the play. You know, I was thinking, um, when I was a kid... I, I, I was born in 1977, so I don't remember the 1978 World Cup. But, you know, I, as a as a kind of football-obsessed kid, and particularly a World Cup-obsessed kid, you would kind of pore over the pictures of, of the World Cups that had gone before. And the ni- 1978 World Cup in Argentina just looked amazing mm. because it was, you know, a heavily bearded, long-haired striker with, you know, ticker tape flying down from, from the stands. And... and you can easily see why people were caught up in the kind of majesty of that, unaware of of what a dark legacy was behind it, you know. And and, yeah. and it's one of the reasons why, you know, because we're doing this series and, and we're not doing every World Cup this summer. Um, we're just picking out a few. And the reason for picking out the 1978 World Cup is really to to sort of start a conversation about, well, what are we prepared to ignore for the sake of the World Cup, because that feels extremely timely at the moment. It does, and I, I think we're, we're going to have a little chat about that now, because looking forwards, as, you, uh, as you're as you sort of hinting towards there, there's a tournament on the horizon um, that could arguably be similarly described as an event that perhaps shouldn't occur. Um, I'm referring, uh, of course, to the planned 2022 World Cup in Qatar, I'm interested to know what what your thoughts are on this, Paul. And whilst we, you know, we can't directly compare it to the tournament in '78, it's a very different situation. Um, but we can draw, you know, broad comparisons in terms of it being a tournament set in a, a less than an ideal environment. I mean, 
I I think that's too soft. I I, I think I I understand why we want to be a bit delicate and a bit politically correct about this. But, you know, in 1978, it was groups like Amnesty International saying this World Cup should not be held here. And Amnesty International have a page on their website called Qatar, the World Cup of Shame, Mm. saying completely explicitly, migrants building a state-of-the-art stadium for the 2022 World Cup in Qatar are abused and exploited while FIFA makes huge profits. Um, uh, uh, they quote a, a metal worker on the Khalifa Stadium saying, my life here is like a prison. If The, manag- the manager said, if you want to stay in Qatar, be quiet and keep working. Um, there are 1.7 million migrant workers in Qatar, over 90% of the work- workforce. 3,200 workers work on the Khalifa Stadium every day. 234 men, uh, more than 234 men are working on the Khalifa Stadium and the Aspire Zone, which is the the area around the stadiums, and are abused and exploited. Some have fallen victim to forced labour. They have pictures of appalling living conditions, talk of um, terrible salaries, delayed salaries, an inability to leave the stadium or the camp. They can't leave the jobs or change the country. This is not me, by the way, that's saying all this, obviously. Mm. This is, I'm quoting directly from Amnesty International here. And and yet the football and and also when you then you have people like Andrew Jennings who has basically spent his entire career, um, well not his entire career because he's a, an older gentleman, but the the latter part of his career um, waving a flag saying FIFA are horrendously corrupt, which now has clearly you know it it reached um, FBI seizure levels, didn't it? That kind of stuff. Mm. And and the drawing of the 2018 and 2022 World Cups in, in both Russia and Qatar is immensely suspicious. So, you know, when you look into the... I don't have the detail to hand, but when as soon as you look into the detail, it becomes... Again, like, suspicious is almost too soft a word. We're almost using... We're almost kind of soft peddling around the edges of this. Mm. It's... I, I just speaking completely personally, I've reached a point where I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, in any good conscience, watch and enjoy these World Cups because the cost of our shared humanity is too great to bear. Mm. Mm. And it's, it's it's interesting that we talk about, you know, I suppose being soft uh, on it in in the in our choice of language or or you know. I don't know, tiptoeing around it slightly. Why? Why are we doing? Why are we doing that, Paul? I think the generous answer is that we do it because we are uncertain, and we don't just want to accept um, without having done the research, or the depth of it. We don't just want to think, okay, Qatar equals bad, um, because that's a, not a particularly smart way to approach life in general. That's why I kind of took the the time to specifically quote from the Amnesty website because. These aren't kind of my opinions, really. These are the opinions of human rights watchdogs mm. who we should probably pay attention to about this stuff. Well, and, the, and I, th- I, you know, I think the scary stat as well. This, this and this report was published about around a year ago. Um, was uh, an estimate for how many migrant workers uh, will have died um, during production of the of the World Cup stadiums in Qatar. In Qatar, you know, by the time the the tournament starts. And it was over a thousand, you know, and I think uh, the vast majority of that are down um, to poor working conditions and uh, poor general levels of health. And uh, as you say, you know, the, the the list that you reeled off early. I mean, the scary thing is that a lot of these people are, are unable to retrieve their passports from the people they work with or the authorities. They can't leave the country. Uh, they can't really do anything but work. They live in... Um, pretty horrendous conditions you know lots of lots of uh, men mostly uh in in one room you know it's, i mean it really it really is horrible and it, and it's funny this thing with fifa as well you, you you touched on it there that um that fifa is corrupt story you know it's kind of almost reached what at the time felt like critical mass and as you say it kind of it reached fbi seizure level that was astonishing when that when that happened. I mean, obviously, I think that it, you know there's an argument to be made that maybe there were political reasons for America intervening as well. But you know, the point that it, that it was, um, you know, that it was it was a kind of legal process for that to occur was quite astonishing. And uh, since Sepp Blatter has has stood aside, and since Gianni Infantino has taken over, um, it's kind of died. You know, that story's died on its ass. Basically, I mean, people aren't talking about how FIFA are corrupt. People have kind of let them carry on. I know that the Qatar World Cup is is still 
five years away um, and perhaps you know that that kind of boycott attitude or that that you know the anti Qatar World Cup attitude that that has existed before might resurface closer to the time but you know again that's that's gone very quiet um and it, it it's interesting to to watch these these narratives kind of dip and trough and uh, and uh, you know i guess build and, and unfold because i think if we talked about this you know 6 or 9 months ago uh, or maybe even a year ago in the heat of of what was happening with fifa we might have been more hopeful i suppose or that that you know the, the the structure of the governing body might look very different to now but i mean as it as it stands uh the the main the main task force investigating fifa is a supposedly independent judiciary uh, body within fifa uh, and it's not on you know it's not really on the back pages of the newspapers anymore people don't really you know people seem to have sort of forgotten is is that a kind of fair assumption I think it's an extremely fair assumption, and I think it's uh, they used a very straightforward tactic, which is which is common in these situations, which is set a figurehead up for a fall because Seb Blatter's gone, and mm. lots of other people are gone too. But the institutional, I mean, Infantino was a Blatter guy, you know, so um, it, it's it's very it's a very limited amount of change that's happened. I think. In fact, we're recording this in England. There's just been a general election. The the leader of the party that was expected to win by a, a, a long way, um, that they, they won the election, but narrowly. I think it's very likely at some point that the leader will carry the can for that election. We've seen the right wing press turning on her specifically. It's it's a pretty classic tactic of just mm. kind of get the figurehead out of the way and then you can carry on doing what you were doing and uh, I don't I don't know whether that's hap- that's what's happened at FIFA but like you said the the story's gone awfully quiet and you know we're talking about 2022 in Qatar there are relatively serious questions to be asked about 2018 in Russia too but we, let's not get into that but you know it's it's uh it's a really complicated messy business and and 1978 is the most obvious, inarguable example of it, but because of the scale of damage done by that regime and how much that regime specifically benefited from the World Cup. But Mm. if the Qatari regime are happy for a thousand people to die, let's, let's, let's be immensely gracious and not say happy, but prepared to allow a thousand people to die in order for the World Cup, which kind of will glamorize you know glamorize yeah. that that infrastructure and all that kind of stuff uh, don't we have to say don't we have to not make the mistake of 1978 basically i think you're right and i think at, at some point people have to ask them ask themselves what their role within that is and um you know for me i'm pretty sure i won't be watching um i won't be supporting it uh, and you know and unless uh, unless things you know, change in quite an extreme way between now and then. That that I, I think will be my position, because it's it's difficult. It would be very very difficult not to feel complicit. Um, you know, in in what is happening to uh, to to those migrant workers, and, and in particular to people who've died to build the stadium for for what, Paul? For yeah, you know, exactly. a, gl- a glitzy World Cup to to you know for sort of again geopolitical reasons to show off a region um, for what, and also. You know, the the, the thing of the, the kind of FIFA part of this story is, you know, we, we talk about grey area and not wanting to soft pedal around this. Um, and and maybe the, the legal ramifications of all the stuff with, with FIFA will come out because the, the wheels of justice do move slowly. But uh, the, a, a World Cup in the summer in Qatar was clearly completely unviable yeah. so they they opted for an unviable bid in one of the richest countries in the world and people wonder why there are corruption allegations you know it's like it's it's let's not be excessively politically correct about this it's pretty obvious where the motivation here is and 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 you know the you asked earlier the thing about did any countries boycott <laughs> the the Argentina World Cup or was that were there calls for a boycott? We're not really hearing any FAs anywhere in the world going, hey, you know what, we really shouldn't be participating in this twenty twenty two World Cup. So you mm. can see how how football is like super prepared to turn a blind eye to these kinds of things. It is, and I, I think that's what happens when 
uh, you know, individuals are part of a, uh, of, of a, you know, a network. I think that's, you know, it's the, it's the old sort of cliche thing they say about corporations that I think you look at some of the, some of the savage acts that, that a corporation might, uh, might undertake during its time. And I think you you imagine the people who are sitting around the board table at the top thinking you know, what arseholes they must be, but really they're, you know, I suppose to, to them, they're not, they're, they shift responsibility around because they're part of a group. You know, they feel like, well, this is the machine at work. This is where the cogs are leading me. I'm just doing my job and I'm not, you know, pushing it. But it's uh, it's the same as a um, a Ouija board. You know, it's uh, ev- everyone is working together to pull pull the stone, even though, you know, no one thinks they're doing anything. So I, I think... Um, I think you're. I think you're right. And I, I, to be honest, unless again, unless it becomes a much bigger story, let's not kid ourselves. Big organisations that that stand to make a lot of money out of this will only be pushed into uh, some kind of moral decision like a boycott um, if there's press and public pressure. I mean, that's the that's. I'm not trying to be cynical, but that is the only reason it would happen. If uh, you know, if anyone thought that they could get away with it, uh, they they would. They would, because I don't think moral issues are at the forefront of of, uh, of the FA's thinking, uh, or, or you know, of any of the football associations of any of the countries thinking. I mean, props to 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 Holland uh, for even discussing it in nineteen seventy eight in nineteen seventy eight in in Argentina, because they had a fantastic team at the time, you know, mm. and so it's, it's a big decision to make. I mean, I think if England were to uh, to duck out, <laughs> probably wouldn't even notice that they weren't there, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, what can people do, Paul? I know that's an impossible question to 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 answer. Uh, so I'm sorry for putting you in this position, but I, I myself, you know, short of talking about it on podcasts, we've made a video about it on the Umax at YouTube channel, which you can go back and watch. That it's about a year old now. It potentially needs a little bit of updating, but the, you know, it, in principle, it's 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 all the same. Um, and 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 other than reading and writing about it, what what can people do? Because I feel essentially helpless as an individual well that's a very big question i mean you could you contact amnesty international ask if there's anything that you know you can join amnesty international and contribute to their work i mean i i guess some people might think that you know, might have objections to the way they work, but whatever. You know, th- that's the kind of thing you can do. You can write to, um, you can write to your FA in the country where you live and ask them what they think about this, what their official positions are on this. Put pressure on elected representatives. You know, organise mm. all that kind of stuff. It's all it's all possible. Or you can boycott sponsors and and that kind of thing. You can you can make it known to sponsors that you are boycotting. Uh, you could even organise a sponsor boycott. You know, all, all of that kind of stuff is is really at, or or just you know at the very basic level don't watch it you know yeah. don't participate in it which obviously you know there's a reason that we're running a series of world cup videos is because we all love the world cup and so that's a it's a big thing to think oh there's there's you know two coming up which I'm not really gonna maybe even watch you may not may not watch a world cup for 12 years paul uh, so it's, it's an upsetting thought, but what I will we'll do in the meantime is just watch you max it coverage of old World Cups. <laughs> that sounds like probably quite a good place to to end uh, after a, a lengthy and sad discussion about the state of the world. Uh, let's end on a plug for our own content. You max it football. Head over to the YouTube channel and watch all of the videos. Paul, thanks very much, uh, and we'll speak to you again in a couple of weeks. I look forward to it.